is Angela Yee, your host of a new show by Acorns, where we talk about untold money stories from some of the most inspiring people in the world. What's up? It's Angela Yee. And once again, I am here with Acorns and we are having these conversations to normalize discussions about money with inspiring people who will talk about their financial journeys. And today I'm super excited to be joined by my friend, Nick Cannon. Queen, what's popping? Good to see you. I'm, I'm happy that you came to Harlem to come come talk about money. This is We're in a community where there's a lot of money being generated and those conversations really need to be had. So. And you got in a nice, rich outfit. Uh, is it? I, well, I guess so. It's, 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 see, that's what I need to talk about. <laughs> I need to be a little less gaudy and uh, <laughs> more focused on, on putting into the community. All right, Nick. Well, let's start at the beginning of your financial journey. Uh, Young Nick. As a kid, what were some things you learned early on in your home about money? How to be broke. <laughs> we was broke, broke. Uh, but you know what? It was, my parents had me when they were teenagers. Mm-hmm. So I remember my mom having two or three jobs at a time, literally, you know, and everything from Section 8 to projects, you know, government assistance. That's that's how we came up. I mean, uh, I grew up with my parents, so... Mm-hmm. My father's mother was a matriarch to my mother, to my dad, who dad just came from the streets, getting incarcerated, changed his life, moved away while I was still stay in California. He moved away to get out of the madness to literally save his life so he could go uh, and become a minister in North Carolina. Wow. So I was passed around a lot uh, and we weren't financially well off at all. And but. It was the hustle mentality. My dad was a hustler. You know what I mean? Like, uh, my mother was, she, she she liked the street life. So, <laughs> so the dude she messed with, I grew up, you know, my stepfather was, you know, one of the biggest drug dealers in our neighborhood. So I grew up that 80s life, you know what I mean? Where mm-hmm. I, I saw the crack epidemic firsthand. I saw how it financially felt, fed my household. Right. Uh, but then at the same time, when I would go live with my dad, I saw... Uh, I was going to say the faith-based hustle, but the the faith-based uh, process of business mm-hmm. uh, could could financially support a family. That is some balance, right, for you. Yeah. And you know what's crazy? I think when I was younger, I didn't know we didn't have money. Right. You don't even realize it. It's just what it is. I, th- I thought we was hood rich. Right. Like we had a Nissan Sentra <laughs> with some rims on it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like my, my stepdad had the, you know, the fresh Cadillac with Dayton's. And, you know, then eventually, you know, my mom came into some bread and like probably like 88, 89, had the fresh BMW 325. I thought we, I didn't know we were still living in the project. We were still living. Yeah, yeah, we had had the big screen. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like when the TVs used to sit on the the ground and stuff. So we were literally, I remember like uh, my stepdad would buy me like truck jewelry and like I had gazelles and Jordans. I remember he he bought me, you know, the uh, the first CD player boombox. So I thought we was rich, but... Mm -hmm. You know, when when it came to getting like, you know, we also experienced those things like the lights being cut off and, you know, have not having, you know, the money to do the school trips and all of that type of stuff. So and then, you know, interestingly enough, as I started to make it on my, my own and it was just me and my mom, uh, we went through some hardships where my mom, you know, lost the crib. And, you know, we was. I started having to pay the rent in high school. Did she explain to you what was happening financially or was this just things that happened and you witnessed it? The crazy thing is I just watched my mom hustle. You know what I mean? I watched her provide for me and her. It was hard, you know, because she she put herself through accounting school. Uh, oh, so she went to accounting school. Yeah. So did she have conversations? Because I know my parents never talked to me about money. I just used to hear them argue about it. Well, it's funny. Me and my mom didn't really start having conversation about money until I started making money. <laughs> and that, but she was an account. Right. She was a bookkeeper, you know, and uh, becoming a CPA. And I was like, you know, it was hard times where like I was, you know, her and I were paying the rent. She lost her job. I was pl- paying the rent. And I'm still in high school. You know, at 17. And then, you know, by the time 17, 18, I started making a bag. So you were acting at that time or? Stand up. 
Stand up. Okay. Stand up. Yeah, stand up in a really, try, you know, the music business. Like, the mu music business was our hustle. Mm -hmm. I literally, we was making money out the trunk of our car, like, learning from the <laughs> Master P's and the E-40s and stuff like that. So we kind of had the city on smash. And then I started going from San Diego, California, up to L.A. And then that's when the real entertainment business popped off. And, you know, I got the deal with Will Smith and all of that. And I was... That was a couple hundred thousand dollars. So we, that was amazing. Yeah, yeah. So I got my I got my mom a condo uh, out of that, and then um, I remember telling my mom we was dead broke before that happened. And I feel like I was like sixteen, and I was like, "Mom, you just you just pray with me. We dedicate, go to church, and I guarantee you, give me a year, and we'll get out of this situation." Because she wanted me to go get more. She want I was working at Wiener Schnitzel. I was working. I was doing all. I was working. Never at, hungry. <laughs> right. I was working at a county, uh, not a uh, a mechanic shop, doing brakes and oil changes. And I would use that dude started, you know, helping me get up to L.A. So he would drive me up to L.A. and all of that stuff. So he believed in you. Yeah, it was love. It was love. He actually looked out. And he was, you know, he was a dude that had some paper in it, and he owned a, you know, a mechanic shop. So he taught me how to work on cars, and he would, in exchange, he would manage me and take me up to. Uh, to LA and that's when it popped off for me. That is absolutely amazing yeah, that, yeah. that things started for you like that. How did they keep you off the streets? That, I mean, I was that's the crazy thing. Like literally entertainment got me out of gang banging, got me out of selling drugs. I dabbled in all of that stuff, but you know, I was like, come on, man. You been like, You've been like <laughs> way too nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, <laughs> well, I was birthed into the drug dealer. If you think about it, drug dealers are some of the nicest, yeah, most really, charismatic yeah. people you know because, <laughs> and they're never really the tough guys. It's the people around them that protect the drug dealers. So I was groomed to be that and saw the inner workings of that. I just knew when people started, you know, dying around me and stuff like that, I was like, I, I literally had to escape, you know, and go to L.A. where it was safer for me. What sparked stand-up for you? Interestingly enough, uh, my dad, I, he was a preacher, and he always thought I was funny. And he would <laughs> never let me watch. I never could watch Martin. <laughs> I, I never could watch Arsenio Hall, but I loved it. So I would hear about it at school. <laughs> and I was like the little church boy under my dad's school when I stayed with him. And he was like, look, I'm not going to let you watch that stuff, but you can make that stuff. And because he had a public access ministry, he had cameras and all. And we had to go through like workshops to be able to check out the equipment. So he would make me go through these like cable vision <laughs> like workshops for the week. I hated that shit. Like I'd have to sit there and learn how to do lighting and audio and cameras. And it I came would, in handy. Yeah, right. And I was and this like 11, 12 years old. And then in exchange for working on his ministry show, he would give me free time. And I would be able to use the cameras. And he was like, yo, you think you're funny and you do all those little in living color and Arsenio Hall bits, do them in front of the camera. And I literally would do that. And then from there, when he would go preach and stuff like that, he would put me on the spot and let me open up for him. He really put that entrepreneur spirit in you. Yeah, my pops was a hustler. My pops still a hustler. Uh, but he was hustling for the Lord. So it was, it was always dope, but it was difficult because I couldn't. I could like I wanted to be a rapper, I, and he was like, "Yo, every kid in his neighborhood wants to be a rapper. Do something different. Be a comedian." And that's what happened. So your first big check was the two hundred thousand dollar check. Yeah, you bought your mom a condo. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny because Will gave it to me, um, and I thought it was two hundred thousand dollars when obviously quickly it became forty thousand dollars. <laughs> but that, uh, but I was. But talk about that, because how does that, yeah. how does a two hundred thousand dollar check break down? People think, okay, he made two hundred thousand dollars, but what? at eighteen too, because mm -hmm. Will found me at like seventeen, and by the time I was eighteen, the check came in, and at the time, I remember Will had a red Range Rover, <laughs> and I was like, I want a black one, <laughs> and this he's the biggest movie star in the world. This is literally ninety eight, <laughs> ninety nine. Uh, and it was 98, end of 98. Mm -hmm. And he was like, don't buy it. And I was like, yo, you just gave me $200,000. Like, right. And at the time, I think Range Rovers was like 60 bands back then. So oh, I was man. I was like, I'm getting this. Like, And, you know, I'm hanging around Keenan and Kel and Ray J and all of them. Like, And, I, and like Brandy had the, the Lexus Land Cruiser and... You know, Keenan had the Forerunner. Kel had the Expedition. I was like, I'm getting a Range Rover, the most expensive one, just the stunt. And Will was like, don't do it. And literally, that was probably my whole check 
not even a year, I totaled that car and lost it and was living back. So you did do house. it. I did it and was living back in my mom. It like, me and my mom was living in that condo <laughs> back in San Diego a year later, thinking where I thought I had made it and was rich and was going to be set for life. So like, because I'm Will Smith oft, often tells his story about how he went broke out to parents just don't understand. Mm-hmm. And he he literally would tell me that story. Right. He was like, I, like, I still want Yeah, it. he was like, I made a million dollars, won a Grammy, <laughs> and I was broke you know, before this Fresh Prince, don't like save this money. And I was like, all right, all right, I'm good. Like, you. He just gave me a whole television deal. This is the first 200,000. <laughs> this is going to keep coming. And uh, like you said, it breaks down. Instantly, the government gets half of that. Right. Taxes. And right. then what you don't realize is representation. I was new to it, mm-hmm. you know, and even still to this day, like your representation is going to be probably at least 30 percent when it comes to managers, lawyers, lawyers, yeah, Yeah, accountants, everything. I didn't, that was my first time getting an accountant. My first accountant kind of did me a little shady because I didn't know no better. And um, and I wouldn't even say they did me shady. I just didn't know no better. You didn't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they, they was doing what they do and not telling me I'm, you know, buying Range Rovers at 18 years old. And that's what I wanted. <laughs> so, you know, that, like I said, that. But you did buy a condo. That was it. So I rented a condo. Oh, you, I thought you bought it. Okay. Yeah, I rented my mom's condo. I wish I would have bought it. Yes. I wish instead of buying that, that Range Rover, I would have just bought my mom's condo. Mm-hmm. But that you was know? a good, valuable lesson early on. hundred percent. So then after that, how did things change for you? Did you really learn your lesson from So that? I went broke. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Under Will Smith's tutelage, he told me. Right. But he, he literally said, I told but you. But you at least were still bringing in money. Kind of. So what <laughs> happened was, because that, that the way I went broke is because Will gave me a deal. Not only he signed me to his label, but, you know, but he signed, he gave me my first television deal, mm-hmm. which was a six episode commitment to have my own TV show. But the show didn't get picked up. Ooh, so that 200,000, yeah, that 200,000 was a holding deal. So that was like, oh, you got more coming. So that broke my heart. And I'm 19 years old, right. but at least I still had the Nickelodeon and that hustle mindset. So I took all of that energy and went back to Nickelodeon like, yo, Will Smith is rocking with me. Y'all got to rock with me. So that's when I got to my pen and I started writing more for, for Nickelodeon shows and I ended up writing my own show. So my next deal was probably for like a half a million dollars. Mm-hmm. And I played that smart. Okay. And then uh, by then I went and I bought myself a house. Then my next check, I believe it was the drumline check. I bought my mom a house. I know that was a nice check. Yeah, yeah. It, you know what? It wasn't. Love Don't Cost a Thing was a nice <laughs> check. Drumline was because that was my first. Okay, I mean, I had a right. small role yeah, in Men in Black too, which I don't even think I got paid for that. So I think for, I'm going to be honest, for Drumline, my first check was probably like 50000 But that was a big look. I was a star of a movie. Right. That was yeah. a big look. And sometimes the biggest things that you'll do at that time aren't going to come with the biggest check. Because yeah. you got $200,000 for a show that didn't even get picked up. Yeah. But then you get $50,000 for For a movie a that's movie. a classic movie. And now, and that, that from that point on, I was making millions after that. Jeez, so that was, Drumline is really what set it off for you, you would say. Yeah. Financially. Financially. That got, that got me in a place where, but I was still immature with money. Mm-hmm. And I think it's because we're not taught financial literacy. Right. I definitely wasn't growing yeah. up. And I, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm still learning. Listen, I mean, all, as you should be, because things yeah. are constantly changing, too. And then even the, the thing that really I feel as a father, you know what I mean? And obviously everybody knows I got a gang of kids. But in that sense, it's like that in itself is providing for households. There's a different mindset that I just recently picked up because everybody's using this term generational wealth. Right. And it's like, do we really know what that means? Or is that just something to aspire to with not knowing the means of how to get to it? And because generational wealth, the reason why we strive for it so much is because we've never had, we've had generational trauma. Mm -hmm. So how can at the same time you seek something where we haven't dealt with the trauma? Part of that trauma is the the financial insecurity and immaturity that comes with it because we're so focused on getting money. Right. We just want to get money. And we're also sometimes scared to lose it. And so we won't take certain risks yeah. that could actually benefit us. And sometimes, I know for myself, I think long-term now, but that was hard for me. Yeah. And the same thing, like you said, when we first put up, we too busy. We want to look rich mm-hmm. instead of being rich. Right. And it's in us. Because you feel like, oh... I got 50000 well, I could spend 20000 Right, because we just want to... Sh- there's so many things. One, it goes all the way back to the culture, to the roots, mm-hmm. to 
So we come from a, a rich people. Africa is the most mineral rich content in the world. Mm-hmm. So we like to show off. Yes. And then imagine you being robbed of all your riches and then left with nothing and told to survive and not even being treated like humans and not and actually being property. You are actually the currency of your DNA. So you're trying to prove, hey, I'm human. I'm not just property. I'm not. And then from that, you're fighting for your rights. You ain't even fighting for the to make money. You're fighting to be able to not be money. Right. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. And the other thing is that there's so many times when we didn't have anything and then we built it up and became rich the reconstruction again. And then, you know, they, it take, they wipe us all out again. Right. And from Black Wall over. Street to all of those things to where, you know, we were, it was in North Carolina. We were the Congress, literally. And it was snatched and burned away from us. So when you think that, then then we get to that space and it's specifically even Black men because when you come from that, that, that at the time, the workforce of you wanted to show your value. And so you were your value even then in that sense. So then you wanted to put on to show your value. So you wanted to look fly. You had to look fly to stand next to the white man. You had to make sure your hair was together. You had to make sure you looked the part because you wanted to be an equal. You wanted to show that I'm I'm just as valuable as this person is next to me. So all of that is the trauma. So you, we got to deal with that before we can actually even be educated in how money actually works. And then, you know I me, mean, I'll talk about it all the time. America's money is all it is. It's not, money's not real. Yeah. It's debt. Yeah. Now, this whole world operates off of debt. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's, it's a big IOU system. And it's the people at the top of the IOU system, the insurance companies, the, the loan companies, the, and, and all of that stuff, who, the banks, obviously, who dictate what the class system is going to be. And you always got to have a lower class in order for those people to be financially secure. And you know what else, too, I realized? And I, I realized this when I went to private school. Some of the people who have the most money don't look like it, right? Facts. It's always That's the people that saying. don't have a lot that look like they do, and the people who have a lot don't care. So if we're going back to lessons learned, mm-hmm. and I, I hate that because I'm still sitting here with this expensive-ass <laughs> watch on, but literally, I got rid of all of my jewelry. But when I was when I started making money and I was rap videos and all of that, I spent I was spending millions of dollars, and it was just stupid. You know what I mean? Because all of those could have been investments. Right. But some people might look at it as watches can be investments because you see the value of some of them increasing. Because I know some people do, I, I used depending to run on that, what you buy. I used to run that rap. Like, even like, I mean, I'm going to keep it a stack. Like this watch right here. It's a little iced out to be. It's too, yeah, it's not an investment. The right. di- the diamonds Take away ruined from- it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like this could have just been a, a collector's piece. But the, the, the billionaire man who would pay, for he don't want diamonds on his. He just wants the plain Jane joint. So those are the ones that are appreciated. So a lot of times when you bust it down, it loses its value. You know what I realized too? When I have a goal that I'm working toward financially, some things don't matter to me. And so if I know I'm trying to get money to buy this house, to put this down payment on this house or to do something else, I'm fine with sacrificing everything else. And I think it's a good practice for me too. to just say, okay, I have a goal to achieve. I want to get X amount of dollars so that I can put this down and then I make it happen and it feels really good and I don't mind what I'm missing out on. So this is my thing with that. And that's a brilliant mindset to have because I'm going to tell you what I still struggle with and what we all still struggle with. It, and going back to that generational wealth conversation is people like us who work a lot, who hustle, who have the privilege and the blessing to be in a space where money is generated. We always know another check is coming. Mm-hmm. And we're always thinking, oh, if I do this this year and this this year and set my goals and I'm living my life, I can get this. I can get that. But that's not generational wealth. Right. That's cash flow. You know what I mean? We're always, we, as I mean, Andre 3000 said it the best. You know, you only funky as your last cut. You mm-hmm. know, if, if you don't move your feet, then I don't eat. <laughs> so we like neck to neck, still living check to check. So in that same vibe, entertainers and people of, of this generation now, because we got influencers that get in stupid bags. We got Instagram, OnlyFans, people pulling in hundreds of thousands so of dollars. What are you doing with it? But what are you doing? You living check to check. You wait, you banking on that next check. And that's just cash flow. We've been cash flow rich. We haven't established wealth yet to where when we go to sleep, 
We make it. Money. Our money is making And we money. are children's children's children are making money off of the things that we do today. Diversity too matters like as far as having money and different things, right? Because I have properties that generate money for me every single month because they're my rental properties. And Smart. they're and they're luxury properties. And I'm always looking at what is my next investment about to be. Smart. But at the same time, I also have my long term investment. So I know that's put away. That's good for the future. I wish I would have I wish I would have thought about that early on. Um and even now, you know what I mean, because I've, I've lost a lot of money in real estate. Mm. I've lost a lot of money in investment. And I tell people real estate is not a for sure thing, too. As it, much as people try to act like that, it can be great. And I've made some, fortunately for me, like all of my real estate investments have done well so far. Well, lucky you, Angela. <laughs> but I don't do a lot. Like I've done... I've lost a, a, a year <laughs> called 2008 that uh, tanked all mine. <laughs> And that's just because, like, when you, again, because my investments in, I was buying family members' homes right. and, and helping people, and they were sound investments. You know what I mean? Hey, let me put you in a house. Let me get you this. But then when you pay X amount of dollars for the house, and then the market crashes, right. then what you pay for the house now, you're in the red. You're like, wow, these houses that I thought were appreciating are now dead. Yeah, yeah, and some uh, with investments, a lot of times it does. You don't see a return on that for years. If you do, if you're lucky enough to see a return, it takes a while, and, and it's you have to be flow. patient. Mm -hmm. It's cash flow. You like, man, when I'm gonna get the money that I invested, when I'm gonna get that back, opposed to like, and that's why I'm saying in, in, in my investment conversation, it's all about IP, intellectual property, and ownership, and investing in yourself. Right, that's be important to me. That that's where I've made the bulk of my money. What has been your best investment? Wilding out. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, that was something no one believed in early on when I was getting to the bag a little bit, you know, early 2000s. And I said, I'm going to pay for it myself. And, you know, I got everybody together, Kevin Hart, all the comedians, all my friends, all the rappers. Mm -hmm. uh, and I rented out a comedy club, got some cameras from the, the tutelage that I knew. <laughs> um, and shot it on my own, put together a presentation pilot. Um, and from that, that gave me the opportunity to negotiate properly when I went to MTV and said, look, I own this. This is mine. Let's make the best deal. And we made a great deal. And I kept ownership, you know, all the way to this day. See, now I want to ask you about that because I remember there was a period of time when they said they were going to do it without you. How would that be possible? That's where it would have got murky. I mean, I mean, again, not to speak too much about the business side of it, but you, you can't really, for, there's many reasons why you can't do it without me, but there's a lot, there were a lot of business things. And that's where, you know, I started getting bullish and <laughs> talking about, I built this billion dollar brand. <laughs> yes. Y'all got to pay me if y'all going to go on with it. And then I was like, I kind of, I was like, let me just get quiet. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I, I got a lot of advice. It's like, I don't got to be out there barking and stuff. It's like. Now, let me ask you this. Did your mindset change when you had children, when it came to finances? What does that what does that click in you? You learn a lot more. You know what I mean? You start having to uh, create trust and build accounts. And that's when you really start to think about generational wealth. When I'm no longer here, who's going to take care of my children? How will they be taken care of? Will they be set? When are they educated enough to be put in a scenario where they'll be responsible and financially secure, mentally, spiritually, and physically to handle whatever it is that we're building. Because we're taking this, you don't have to think about it, you're taking the burden. Money is a burden. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And you're putting it on to your offspring, to your children. Although not having money is probably, you think, a bigger burden? How do I, I hate this conversation <laughs> only because uh, I truly believe there's this thing called access to excess. Mm -hmm. And because I'm a true believer in energy, if you mismanage an abundance, you you fall in an abundant way. So I've, I've been broke and, you know, not being able to pay some bills and hardships is, that's tough. But I've also been broke where you're responsible for six, seven mortgages and you're responsible for uh, for things that like, there's no way to climb out of this hole. You know what I mean? You you could be broke in a, uh, I've been broke in an apartment and then I get another job or I go hustle and get another second, third job. And now I can pay my rent. Right. When you're in debt four or five million dollars, where you gonna get that other four or five million dollars from? You know what I mean? And that's where I've seen a lot of my peers go down hard, fast, and it, it 
puts them in a, a dark depression. Uh, it puts them in a space where there is no coming out. Granted, you just want stability. Mm-hmm. That's what we're all looking for. We're looking for stability and balance. And then ultimately, to be able to be content. That word is a, 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 a strange word because... You never want to feel content, right? Right, but that's the thing. But contentment is also like when it takes it back to that space of of monks. Monks are content. Because they want for nothing. They live in they the don't, moment. They don't, they don't desire abundance. They're just, they, they find happiness within. So that's what I'm, I'm in that space now to where that, that minimalist idea. And that's even what Kanye talks about mm-hmm. sometimes where it's like the less is more thing. But I mean, he's also But then he goes from, the other way. Yeah, and yeah. But, <laughs> but And I, I understand the struggle because you realize when you, ha- when you have children, when you, have, you want to teach your children the value of like money isn't everything. Mm-hmm. You know, but as, then they say, yeah, that's easy to say when you got money. But for your kids who are old enough, what do you teach them about money? Like, how do you handle that? I mean, one, it starts with math, which, you know, is is amazing. So I remember I I teach all of my kids, you know, I just start with dollars and cents, piggy banks, all of that stuff. Like if they want something, are you like, okay, this cost, like, how do you handle it? I make them, I make them do the math. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. When they want something off of Amazon, you know, you create an allowance, you're like, all right, well, you got to do this whole map. You want you want how how many Roblox or V bucks? And all right, how does that how does that translate into dollars? Okay, you spent this this week. Why now? Th- now break that down of how and the fact that they have to go through that process. That's how you teach them the value of money because otherwise it is like oh, I just want this and I can get I can it. Get anything? Yeah, yeah, but you. I remember uh, what I used to do when Toys R Us was. Uh, on every corner. Uh, Shouts out, that's one of my investments right now. Oh, bringing Toys R Us back? All day. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, and, and we're bringing it back in a big way. Uh, but uh, I remember I used to take Rock and Roll, my oldest, to Toys R Us, and I would give them each $100. And I would say, all right, go in there and get whatever you want. Now, you guys can combine your $100 because there's two of you. <laughs> you can get one thing or you can, you know, and it's funny because, like, my son would always go to the biggest thing in the store and be like, all right, dad, I want this hundred dollars and I need you to cover the difference. Like it don't work like that. <laughs> but my daughter would take her hundred dollars and go buy a bunch of small little things and have a whole shopping cart full of look just little trinkets for her hundred dollars. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. They're like the, opposites on how they spend yeah, their money. Yeah. So but it's like now and help now I know where I need to work with Rock a little bit more and I I can see where I need to work with with Monroe. So it's like, all right, well, we'll, we'll figure it out. But it all starts with math. And even like being married, how do finances work for you when it comes to being married? That's one. Uh, we're not going to get to this monogamy conversation. No, no, no. Not, I'm just talking no, about... No, no, but I'm just saying, but it leaked because I don't want to sound... Because I know how <laughs> You don't want to keep on talking. Yeah, I know how people think of when I approach this process. But I, when I say this, marriage is a business. Mm-hmm. And that's what I learned. And I learned like there's contracts. There's involved. definitely contracts. There's uh, and it, it could be a great business. It could be a great investment. There's definitely breaks in your taxes. Yeah, there, it, <laughs> marriage can be a, a very lucrative business if you if you do it properly. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's what I learned. It's like it has nothing to do with actual love. You know what I mean? It's it could be an example of love. It could be some things, but you literally are walking into you like okay, we're bonding ourselves together financially to where we're we're taking our names together we're taking our properties together and then there's lawyers that are going to be involved to say well you should just in case this you should like it's literally a negotiation table and when you go back to the court and that's why I said I've I've gotten in trouble talking about this before <laughs> when I when I'm always in in defense of a non-monogamous scenario I always talk about the root of marriage never started with love. It was a business transaction. It was, well, you could be monogamous and not be married, too. So true. it doesn't really have to So be. that's why we only have to talk about that. Right. So, <laughs> you want a monogamy. I didn't No, but I'm just saying that. that's just because that's a lot of the reasons because it's a great, it's a covenant. It's a great example to say, look, I love this person so much that I'm willing to become one with this person. But when you're becoming one, you're becoming one corporation. People already look at me at a certain way. From the day I meet them, Mm -hmm. they have a perception of who I am, how much money I probably have, and what I can do for them. So I don't get that that 
beautiful journey of, oh, let's build this together. Unless it was somebody who was equal to you financially. Well, and- Mariah was beyond five. She had more money than me. And it was, and that was inspiring. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That made, that that ignited the hustle even more. Uh, and I'm grateful to her for that. To allow, like that turned me up uh, in that sense of like, oh, I can go get it because I'll aspire to be just as powerful as she is. Right. So well, you can go back to the bottom again. If I you hope. No, no let's, let's, <laughs> let's not do that. <laughs> now, let me ask you this. What are some things you wish you were better at financially? Saying no. Mm-hmm. Uh, no is a powerful word. Yeah, yeah. It's probably the most powerful word. It actually probably make you richer than anything. I don't even know how to say no to myself. Right. You know what I mean? Like, if I want something, I go get it. I, I, the discipline in saying no, I wish I would have learned that early on. How important is, is it for you to support certain businesses? Because you going somewhere or you tweeting about something brings so much attention. Anytime for the culture. That's why we're right here in Harlem right now. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I said I wanted to do my talk show in Harlem. I'm investing in properties in Harlem. I'm bringing my restaurants and, and my community centers to Harlem to to, you know, Southeast San Diego, South Central Los Angeles, to Atlanta, to Detroit, like all of these places that I truly feel like the culture is and the community is. And if I could lend my influence and my energy to those spaces, then, you know, again, we can build up, we can build us up the way that we were doing during Reconstruction. Well, listen, I know, Nick, that you are such a busy person. And so I do appreciate you because I feel like I learned a lot about you and your whole mindset just from having this conversation. And the last thing I need to do is this rapid fire. So if you have with it. a little time for this. I got it. I, put me put me in the hot seat and I, I got you. <laughs> All right, Nick. So this has been great. Thank you. This is our rapid fire of money questions. I get nervous with you because you, no, you don't. You 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 ask them hard hitting questions. No, this is just about money. We, okay, you're not in the rumors today. All right, all right cool. <laughs> Let's get it. I'll do that on your show. You're right. What was the first concert you ever bought tickets for? MC Hammer. Ooh. You know it's crazy, and uh, Dr. Dre walked past me. Uh, he had just he got out of cab, and I guess I want to say I forgot who was performing, but I, the fact that I was standing in line for an MCM concert and I saw Dr. Dre walk past me, it was like nineteen ninety, maybe the crazy. All right, is there an artist that you would collaborate with for free? Stevie Wonder. Ooh, that's, that's I would pay. Yeah, I would right, pay right, money. Right, for free. <laughs> I would invest in that. Yeah. What did you spend your first big check on? My mom's crib. What did you spend your last big check on? See, I don't know. I don't. I don't live check to check no more. So I don't know. <laughs> so many of them. Yeah, I just. I don't. I don't, I don't think. But what's about your last big purchase? Something probably for my kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a home. Yeah, <laughs> a, Damn. Home, a home for my children to live in. <laughs> All right. Um, what's the best money move you ever made? Wilding out. What is the greatest money lesson you've learned? How to say no. Um, what is the worst money advice you've received? Spend it. Uh, spend it as soon as you get it. <laughs> Blow the bag. Mine, I spend it. <laughs> All right. What is a money mistake you learned the hard way? The trinkets, the depreciating things. You know what I mean? Jewelry, cars, none of that stuff has real value. And then you sit at home like, why did I buy this? And you yeah. look at it like, ugh. And it becomes a liability. Like, I had so many cars at one point in time that my, I mean, I, my car bill was hundreds of thousands of dollars. Not, <laughs> Not like own the cars, but right. what the upkeep. All right. When do you feel empowered by money? When I can give it to my loved ones. What is your favorite thing to spend money on? Uh, my loved ones, my oh, family. I'm gonna say that. <laughs> um, what is your- also the empower when I always say more than my loved ones. I also can when I can put it into my community. Right, and you can see the difference that it makes. Indeed. What is your least favorite thing to spend money on? Depreciating assets. <laughs> it feels good at the time until that's in retrospect. Yeah. Because you wouldn't buy it if you thought like that. What would be your money advice to 20-year-old Nick? Yeah, invest in yourself. Mm-hmm. Continue to, you know, allow your money to make you money. And, and intellectual properties, keep creating. And last but not least, what is your best money advice to someone else who's on their come up? Energy is currency. Manage your energy. Invest in your energy. Um, when you can have that concept that the physical money is not real, but the idea of where you put your efforts and your time, that's what real money is. And it's also, I think, you know, one of one of my mentors said it best. Uh, money don't make you happy. Happy makes you money. 
Okay. All right. I like to spend money to get happier. <laughs> but not when but it, I'm sad, but it, yeah. But that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, think about it. Imagine if you were able to take care of your family by the things that make you the happiest. That is actually what makes me happy when I can do something great for my parents. Right. Or for my brother when they ask me for something and or they don't even But if it's me. your skill set or your talent that made you that money. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like the thing that you love the most, whether it's, you know, journalism, entertaining, being like that's that's the beauty. That's the blessing that we have is yes. that, you know, I've had I mean, I didn't have a bunch of them, but I had those jobs that I hated going to, mm-hmm. that I had to get up hella early in the morning, take three buses to get to, or be in there with hot dog grease, or, you know, <laughs> change it. Oh, I hate this. What was the place you worked at? Wiener Schnitzel. Wiener Schnitzel. <laughs> <laughs> but then, but even like, you know, I was door-to-door candy, so like things that I hated doing. And right. then when I got to the, my, my, my gifts and what God has blessed me with allow me to provide for my family. It's the greatest blessing in the world. I had those jobs. Every morning I woke up like, should I call out today? Right. Every morning I lay in bed like, is today the day that I'm going to call out? <sighs> Let me just go get it over with. Yeah. And that's why I would say, find something that you love and you'll never work a day in your life. We don't have to like, just think about that existence. Live your life doing something more than just paying bills. And wherever you can do it, you know what I mean? And again, that's where I go back to energy. If if it's feeding into your community, if it's feeding into your family, find something that makes you truly happy. Well, thank you so much, Nick. I really appreciate you for doing this and having yeah. this conversation about finance. All day, all day. After this, back to our regularly scheduled. I know, right? That <laughs> gossip is coming. Rumors are coming. <laughs> Nick Cannon, thank you so much. No doubt. <laughs> I'm Angela Yee, and thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you hit me up on Twitter, on Instagram, at Acorns, and let me know who you'd like me to talk to next about one of my favorite topics, money. All right, now let's get to the business. Listen up. These conversations do not reflect the views of Acorns. The material is only informational. It's not investment advice. It's not a recommendation, an offer, or sale of securities. Remember that investing involves risk, which includes the loss of principal. We always tell you that. Investment advisory services offered by Acorns Advisors, LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor. Brokerage services are provided to clients of Acorns by Acorns Securities, LLC, an SEC-registered broker-dealer and member at FINRA SIPC. For more information, visit acorns.com. 